Our guest today is Comptroller for the State of Illinois and a candidate for Mayor of Chicago. She is the first Hispanic to ever run for and win a statewide office in Illinois as a Democrat. As Comptroller, our guest today helped manage Illinois through the worst fiscal crisis in our state's history. She is originally from Chicago's little village neighborhood and currently lives in Portage Park with her husband, David, who is with us today. David, City Club, welcome to David. They are the proud parents of their fabulous six-year-old son, David Quinton. Ladies and gentlemen, Susana Mendoza. Susana. Well, thank you, Jay. Uh, he did forget one key thing in that bio, or the intro, is you will see my name on the ballot. <laughs> Look, it's great to be back at the City Club. I, I'd like to start by recognizing my husband, David. I know uh, Jay did that, but it's more special when I do it. Right, honey? Yeah. David, like always, is here to support me at the City Club, but yesterday was our seven-year anniversary. Hey. Yeah, so what that means is that I am one lucky lady. So thank you, honey. I love you. So I returned today for one simple reason, because I love this city. And I've lived its problems. I've experienced its greatness. And at this critical period of change and challenge, I want to hold Chicago to its promise for every neighborhood and for all of our people. But before I start to lay out part of my agenda to you here today, I want to take a few moments to acknowledge the huge loss last night of two real life heroes in a tragic accident. District 5 Chicago Police Officers Conrad Gary and Eduardo Marmolejo. Officer Gary was the father of an infant while Officer Marmalejo was a father of three. Both officers were married. Both wives are now widows. I hope you will join me in praying for these fallen officers and the families they leave behind. May they find comfort in knowing that they're not alone in their grief and that the city of big shoulders is also a city of big hearts that cries big tears for the loss of two of its finest. I have the utmost respect and admiration for those who wear the uniform and sacrifice so much every single day to keep our neighborhood safe. And my heart breaks for their families and for the colleagues, for their colleagues in the Chicago Police Department. This has been a really tragic year, specifically filled with devastating loss for the 5th District Chicago Police. We're united today and offer our condolences and stand with them in their loss and grief. I'm running for mayor because nothing less than the future of the city of Chicago is at stake. Like so many Chicagoans, I'm the daughter of immigrants, hardworking immigrants who came here, right here to Chicago to build a better life. And a life that was focused on what could be better, not focused on things of the past. Immigrants built this city, every inch of it from the first skyscrapers to homes like mine in the bungalow belt. We must rely on the strength of our diversity and the promise of the next generation of people from these and other shores to build and rebuild our neighborhoods. Yes, of course, I take pride in our beautiful skyline. It's beautiful. And I know how essential a strong business community is to our city's success and our future. And I appreciate the many in this room who help contribute to it. I love that Chicago is a magnet for tourism, from tourists from all over the world. And I intend as mayor to compete for every single job and business that we can bring to Chicago. But to me, the heart of Chicago is where people live and raise their families. 
And my focus as mayor will be to make our neighborhoods safe, affordable, and livable for all, not just some of us. It's time to have a mayor who is from the neighborhoods, who understands neighborhoods, and who'll put neighborhoods first. The next mayor still will have to tackle some serious fiscal challenges without adding to the burden of already hard-pressed homeowners. Having led the state through the worst fiscal crisis in its history, I feel well qualified to lead that effort and look forward in the coming weeks to offering my thoughts on the path forward. But today, I want to address the sickening, senseless plague of violence that has gripped too many of our neighborhoods, claimed too many of our babies, and broken too many hearts. And the problem is compounded by the gulf of trust that separates the police from too many people in the hardest hit communities. I was born in the city of Chicago on the southwest side in Little Village community. Wonderful community, however, violence was an issue still back then. Since then, the number of gangs and guns on our streets have exploded. And with them, so has a casualty count that on some days seems more like a war tally. Yes, we've seen some improvement over the past two years, and every life that is spared is obviously something to celebrate. But we still have an intolerably high rate of violence, far more than most other big cities. We lose too many kids to guns and gangs and to early graves and long incarcerations. In 2017 alone, 246 children, our children, were victims of a shooting. 38 of them died. It's tragic, and it has to stop. To honor their memory, we must do everything in our power to end the senseless violence and prevent more parents from losing and mourning their children. And we need to do more to keep our children out of the line of fire. I know what it's like to be one of those kids, to have violence follow you around like a shadow. And I know what it feels like to be scared to walk to school. It's hard to learn when you're scared. I mean, when you're thinking more about the, the walk back home from school than walking through the lesson on that day's chalkboard. When I was a kid, someone was murdered on our block, so close to home. And like so many families, uh, our neighborhood and our families felt traumatized by this violence. My parents felt that the only way that they could protect me or my brothers was to do what they could, and in their mind, it was to get us up and out of our neighborhood. And no family should have to leave their neighborhood because they're afraid of the violence. Now, we need to properly train and resource our police officers, but just as importantly, we need to invest in our neighborhoods and invest in human capital to address the root causes of violence. As a child from a neighborhood victimized by violence and as the sister of a police detective, I see this issue from a unique perspective that no other candidate for mayor possesses. Every day, there are mothers, especially the mothers of young black men, who wonder when their kids leave the house that morning if they might not make it back home that night. They worry that one wrong move or a series of bad decisions brought on by a lack of opportunity or just being in the wrong place at the wrong time could be deadly. And yes, that might include an encounter with a police officer. On that same day, there are wives or husbands, sons and daughters, who wonder when their loved one puts on that police uniform and straps on that body armor, whether they too might not come home at the end of that shift. I see this reality because I've lived this reality, and it, it will drive me every day as mayor to bring Chicago back together as one family to face the issues of crime and violence and address its root causes. We will do it right. We will do this with a new way of policing and a new way of educating our kids. And we will do this together. I want to say loudly and clearly that we should all admire any man or woman who puts on a uniform and is willing to lay down their life on behalf of someone else that they haven't even met. Whether they are Marines or soldiers or sailors or closer to home, our police officers, firefighters, and EMTs, 
we should honor those who put their lives on the line for us every single day. And I thank everyone who wears a uniform and especially for their courageous service to this city. But while those who wear the uniform are everyday heroes, real life heroes, they ought not have the warrior mentality of those heroes who, served, uh, who serve us in our armed forces. Because when it comes to tackling crime here in Chicago, there should be no us and them. There should only be we. Despite the fact that they carry a firearm and wear body armor similar to what our soldiers wear, we need to instill in our police officers a completely different ethos. One, the Obama Justice Department, bless you, <laughs> report calls a guardian mindset. Think about this, a guardian mindset. The report explains that the concept of a police officer as a guardian or as a protector is very different from a police officer with the warrior mentality, one that is inordinately based on fear. Restoring trust between our people and our neighborhoods and the men and women who serve them is absolutely fundamental to a comprehensive effort to reduce crime. In my mind, beginning to transition the mindset of the police department to the guardian concept is critical to rebuilding this trust and enlisting citizens as allies in quelling the violence that tears apart our neighborhoods daily. That is just one of the many reasons why the consent decree based on the outline provided by the Obama Justice Report, Department Report, I should say, will guide my administration as we remake our approach to reducing crime. That means an end to the code of silence. It means reaching for a higher standard, not covering up mistakes of the past. Crime has no color, and neither does the code of silence. They're both wrong, and we must bridge that gap. My police superintendent and every commander will be charged with both protecting our citizens and living up to the highest standards of professionalism and partnership with citizens. That's not an either or. The two must go hand in hand if we are to restore the trust of our people. Where neighbors stand shoulder to shoulder with their local police officer and guard against violent crime. I am strongly committed to training and equipping our officers with the tools and the lessons they need to de-escalate first, rather than engage first. Our officers need better training to recognize mental health issues when they arrive on the scene, especially recognizing those situations where an individual poses a threat to others, but also to themselves. Our police personnel need better training in de-escalating domestic violence situations as well, ones that can be just as potentially dangerous and deadly to the police officer as they are to the woman involved. Now most people make the mistake of thinking about police training as something we do only to prepare new recruits. And frankly, for too long, that's how the CPT viewed training. Run the recruits through the police training, through the academy, assign them to the most dangerous districts, and then hope for the best. Now, frankly, we have to do better. We need to completely revamp the CPD's training programs, whether it's pre-service at the academy, in service with veteran personnel on a regular basis, and in the field where commanders should use everyday examples on the street to reinforce these trainings learned and relearned in the classroom. And let me be clear, you cannot, you cannot retrain and constantly update the trainings of 12 thousand sworn police officers with the out-of-date, out-of-scale training infrastructure we have in Chicago today. It's not possible. That's why I support building a police and fire training academy. The fact is, look, it's fair to critique the top-down approach that mostly ignored community input and even questioned the final cost of this training center. But if we're going to spend this much money on a building, we need to ensure that all of its neighbors benefit by making it a true community hub with space for local nonprofits and social service organizations and adjacent parks that are safe places, safe spaces for kids to play. But any candidate who tells you that we can retrain and maintain a high level of training for 12,000 sworn personnel with the facilities that we currently have just isn't being honest. A world-class facility is just the first step. We should ensure that all sworn officers receive crisis intervention training in the academy so that they can be certified on day one, not 18 months after they started their service. Now we owe it to every mother who watches their child walk out the door 
And we owe it to every spouse and child of every officer who walks out their door in the morning to do everything that we can to make sure that they all come home safely. All of them. And that starts with better police training. In addition, I strongly support hiring more detectives so that we can solve crimes more quickly. That's it. USA Today called big city murder clearance rates in general and Chicago's rock bottom 17% clearance rate in particular a national disaster. And you know what? They're right. It is a disaster. We must solve crimes quickly, especially gun crimes, so that one shooting doesn't mushroom into two or three or ten. I support technology-driven hubs in our most dangerous neighborhoods so that we can track crime in real time to guide our comprehensive strategy to head off gang issues before they actually become deadly. And I strongly support real gun safety laws that will stem the tide of cheap and illegal guns that pour over the skyway from Indiana, find their way to Chicago from other states with weak or non-existing gun laws, um, or are, I would say more importantly, bought from unscrupulous gun shop dealers right here in our state of Illinois. Knowing that 40% of all guns used in crimes in Chicago originate from in-state gun store purchases, we must finally pass legislation to mandate that the state of Illinois license every gun shop. Now, Governor Rauner vetoed our last effort, so I'll work with Governor Pritzker and the House and the Senate to finally put this common sense legislation into law. <clears throat> but really, the police only deal with the symptoms of crime. All the training, equipment, and technology really doesn't address the root causes of violence. Gun laws can help, but they don't deal with the underlying reason why young people pick up a gun in the first place. That's why we must invest in neighborhood jobs and we must invest in human capital. I'm here today to unveil a comprehensive policy using the community school concept to finally help close the achievement gap, create opportunity in neighborhoods that for too long have been felt left behind and attack the root causes of violence. Back in Little Village, before my parents felt that they needed to leave the city, my refuge was the Boys and Girls Club around the corner from my house. There I met a young woman named Cookie. Cookie was tough and cool and smart. And she preached to all of us, boys and girls, that we were better than we ever gave ourselves credit for. And that gangs weren't a place to step up, but instead were quicksand that would eventually pull us down. I wanted to be just like Cookie, which is why I returned to Little Village after college to make my own stand for the neighborhood that I loved. It wasn't my choice to leave as a little kid, but it was my choice to come back after college. I was proud to represent Little Village in the Illinois House for over a decade, as many of you know, trying in my own way to be just like Cookie and point a better way to all of our kids. And this has truly been a lifelong passion for me. In the Illinois House, I sponsored and worked tirelessly to secure the votes necessary to provide free breakfast to any child attending any Illinois school where 40% of their population was eligible for free or reduced lunch. In other words, schools with poverty. Because here's the deal, you know, our kids can't learn if they have an empty stomach and they can't wait until noon to get their first meal. But we have to do so much more. I applaud the efforts of Mayor Emanuel to expand and improve mentoring and after school programs to increase our kids' opportunities and open up their world of the view. And eight years ago, there was essentially nothing in the budget for mentoring, not, not even an actual dedicated line item in the city budget. As mayor, I intend to build on the successes of effective mentoring programs like BAM and WOW and character building opportunities like I found at places like the Boys and Girls Club so that we can give our children in every neighborhood in the city, here, hope for a life beyond drugs and gangs. Mentors show the way and inspire kids to reach higher even when those kids start on the lower rungs of their ladder. As controller, I see all too clearly how disinvesting in human capital has fatal and expensive consequences. It's both morally corrupt and fiscally unsound. We cannot shortchange family and mental health services and think that we're ever going to stem the tide of violence in our most underserved communities. But we need some new thinking when it comes to neighborhood investment, not just improve on existing initiatives or restore funding of programs that have been cut. 
That's why I'm a big believer in the concept of community schools where children can not only get after school programs, but also a decent supper while their parents receive job training or help with language skills or wraparound services. These services help parents earn better wages and empower them to solve some of their own issues that are caused by suffocating poverty. I visited Spencer Technology Academy on the west side where they provide after school programming, crisis intervention, and even some dental services for students. And I saw the promise this concept can deliver, but I want to do so much more. Across the country, schools are struggling with the achievement gap. When students who come from tougher neighborhoods or start with fewer resources continue to lag behind their peers. Now, what does the achievement gap look like in our schools here in Chicago? <clears throat> Follow me here. In elementary schools, it means that black students are 10 points below the mean reading score, while white students are 22 points above it. In elementary math, the gap is wider. Black students are 13 points below the district's mean, and white students are nearly 26 points above it. In both, Latinx students are right at the mean, and we're doing better with our students of color than any other district in Illinois, according to a UIC study. I mean, just imagine how well they'd be if there was no achievement gap. By the time kids get to high school, the achievement gap has lifelong consequences. The percentage of black students who get a three or higher on an AP exam, usually the bar for getting college credit, is just over 20%. That's nearly double what it was in 2011, but far short of the nearly half of Latinx students and 70% of white students who score a three or higher on an AP exam. Now, I could go on and on with the statistics, but I know this. White students are not born any smarter than black or, Lat or Latinx students. And it's our job. It's our job to give every child in this city a shot at living up to their potential. No one anywhere in the country has done a great job of closing the achievement gap, but that's not going to stop me from trying. I'm setting a goal of cutting the achievement gap by half in the next eight years, with a clear roadmap for eliminating it entirely. I will view every educational decision through a simple prism. Does it help to close the achievement gap? We have to think boldly and transformationally in this city. That's why I'm excited about my new initiative. Based on this community cool, actually, yeah, it should be called the community cool concept. <laughs> it's super cool. That will help in my quest to address some of the issues that contribute towards that achievement gap. Now, instead of asking which 50 schools we should close next, I'll be focused on which 50 most underutilized schools we should be doubling down on turning them into true community hubs and stronger academic centers. I refuse to give up on our kids. I call it the 50 new initiative. 50 stands for the number of community schools we would create within existing underutilized school buildings over the next eight years. New stands for neighborhood education works. Here's how it would work. Rather than close a school with lower enrollment, my 50 new initiative would use the extra space in those buildings to offer space to neighborhood daycare centers because equity in the achievement gap starts young. Early education is important. It is probably the most important place that we can invest our dollars. And space to family service providers and job training organizations. Those organizations, in turn, could spend less of their budget on rent, utilities, and other overhead costs, and thus invest more into caring for actual children, delivering crisis intervention centers, services, I should say, and helping parents find and keep jobs. I would spearhead a drive asking leading philanthropic organizations, so listen up, <laughs> and, other, uh, and the building trades to transport job training and other services into these community schools as well, making underutilized schools places where parents want to send their kids and where they can also go to get help, training, services, and jobs. Now, to pay for this bold initiative, CPS would leverage some of the $70 million in additional equity funding from Springfield that we fought very hard to get. And this would happen annually to provide after-school staff who can help with homework and additional support for students who have difficulty in reading and math. 
And patterned after my school breakfast legislation, CPS would feed students supper while their parents and family members get the job training and services they need. And those kids would be in a safe environment. Now, this isn't in my speech, but I'm just going to say this. Like, I'll, I'll get to the fact that David and I have a son who just started kindergarten at a local neighborhood public school. And I know how hard it is for us to be able to go pick up our son at 3.15 every day. And thank God that David has flexibility with his job schedule, but how do parents do it in this city? How come no one talks about this? Like, Parents with means can figure it out, but if you don't have means, how are you supposed to keep a job and pick up your child from school at 315? It's not possible. We need to talk about these things that are happening in our city. Now, it's crazy, it's crazy. Now, whatever your view on closing 50 schools is, I believe it was a big mistake not to involve the community in a discussion of how we use these school buildings, these community assets to help uplift the neighborhood instead of just turning out the lights and locking the doors and saying, we're done. We can begin to right that wrong in the next eight years under the 50 new initiative because this is yet another place where crime and education are inextricably linked. Our son, little David, who just turned six on December 4th, it's like all we talk about these days. <laughs> Whenever I tell him to do something, he goes, no, mommy, I'm six. This is a scary thought, folks. All right. But you know, we're excited that he attends a local neighborhood CPS public school. Now, we chose to send David there because we want him to grow up with a real connection to a real Chicago neighborhood and real sense of community. And we are so proud, my husband and I, that we're going to be proud CPS parents for the next 13 years of our lives. So when it comes to improving public schools, we have huge skin in the game. And like no other candidate presently running for mayor, and frankly, no other mayor who has led Chicago in my adult lifetime. I share the dream, the same dream, and the same expectation of every parent that when we send our children to a neighborhood public school, that they'll get a good education, and most importantly, that they will come home safely. Now, what's been missing too often in this conversation about how to improve our schools has been the voices of public school parents and the teachers who teach our kids every day. That's why I strongly support an elected school board, so the voices of parents and teachers can be heard when major decisions are made about the next generations of Chicago and Chicagoans. But for too long, certainly when my opponents were running the schools 20 years ago, but also up to the present day, too often education policy has been something that we do to communities and done to our families, not worked out with parents and with our teachers, and that must change. But as a Chicago public school parent for the next 13 years, I not only want to make sure the voices of teachers and parents are heard, I want the next mayor, whomever she may be, yeah. to have skin in the game too. To me, a purely elected school board that leaves the mayor out and lets the mayor, frankly, off the hook is just plain bad policy. And we need more accountability from the mayor, not less. We need every decision made on infrastructure the city makes and the spending of every TIF dollar to be made in concert with what's best for our public schools. Only an engaged mayor with seats at the school board table can make sure that that happens. As controller, I traveled the state and strongly supported the efforts of the chief architect of education funding reform, Senator Andy Menar and Representative Will Davis, to completely rewrite the, school, the state school funding formula so that Chicago and other communities with low-income students could finally get their fair share of the resources. Now, that, the state shortchanged Chicago for far too long. We won that battle. And also, as controller, I used every tool at my disposal to identify ways to keep Chicago public schools and the funding to them, that lifeline that they needed going during that horrible 736-day budget crisis that Governor Rauner um, led. Now, thankfully, we found a way to win that battle, too. But Chicago's at a crossroads, and that's why we need a mayor who understands Springfield and the process so that we can secure the resources that we need to fully fund education and other critical services for the people of this great city. Now, no other candidate for mayor brings these skill sets to this job. And no one will fight harder than I will in Springfield to bring Chicago what it needs because I don't give up until the job is done. As controller, I don't. 
As controller, I championed a debt restructuring initiative that you've heard me speak about. This helped me cut the $16.7 billion backlog that was the case a little over a year ago in, in November to what is today you know, less than half of that. This initiative itself that I had to fight the governor on, that just doesn't make any sense, but we got it done. It's going to save taxpayers between four and six billion with a B dollars over the next 12 years. I also work closely with members of the House and Senate in Springfield to pass the largest transparency reform in the history of the Comptroller's Office, the Debt Transparency Act. Now, Governor Rauner vetoed that bill, but I put my legislative you know, chops to work here. And with the help of both Democrats and Republicans in both the House and the Senate, in the House, we passed, we actually overrode the governor's veto of that bill unanimously, something that has never happened in the history of the state of Illinois. Now we got this done because I've spent years cultivating relationships and translating policy goals into legislation that not only passes, but actually works in the real world. Now I know how to bring people together in support of sensible policies, but here's the deal. In other words, I know how to get stuff done. <laughs> that need is no more critical today when our next mayor is going to have to fight than it is today when our next mayor is going to have to fight for our fair share of funding in Springfield. Because the fight is never over. And money, though, I want to be clear about this, money isn't the only solution to our educational challenges, but investing in our neighborhood public schools and making sure that children all across this city, no matter where they live, have equal access to quality education is the foundation. We simply can't have a mayor who needs on-the-job training when it comes to working with everyone in our state capitol, the House and the Senate, Democrats and Republicans, the governor and the leaders. And just because you've kicked around government for 20 or 30 years doesn't mean you know how to get things done in Springfield. I have, and I will. I'm ready to get to work on our schools at every level, from the neighborhood school my son attends to implementing my 50 new initiative to transform our most under-resourced neighborhoods in this city. <clears throat> When I think of big things that we can do for our students, like reducing and eventually eliminating the achievement gap, we first have to build equity on every level because the majority of our students are not starting school where they should academically or emotionally. Too many students go undiagnosed with neurological issues and those who are diagnosed go without services that they need for their care. Let me just say, folks, that is shameful. It is shameful how we treat our children with special needs or disabilities in our school system, both on a state level and in the city. And as controller, I made it my number one priority in times of fiscal crisis to prioritize folks who couldn't advocate for themselves, especially the most vulnerable amongst us, and at the front of the line of payments are children and adults with disabilities or people who care for them. Why should we treat our school children differently? That's gonna change when I'm your mayor. <clears throat> And, and frankly, there is a curable illness in this city that many children are afflicted with. It's called hopelessness. We can and we must end that for every single child. Now, we can never give up on a child regardless of their address, their income, their learning level, especially their color or other challenges that they may have. And it's our one job as adults to take care of these children as if they were our own children. We need to treat every child as if they were our own child. Why? Because as parents, you would want and demand the very best for your child, because you love them and you would do anything for them. But what about the children out there whose parents love them just as much, but can't advocate for them in the same way that you or I can, because they don't have the tools or the resources or connections that most of us in this room have? We need to make, we, we, us, we need to make sure that every child feels just as valued, just as loved, as my own or as your own. And that's how we start to build equity for them. Many children feel invisible, feel hopeless. When I'm elected, I want them to know that their mayor sees them and believes in their potential. They'll not be invisible to me and they shouldn't be to you either. While I'm running for mayor, I will always first be a mom. And that is the lens of my mayoralty. My sights are set on the future, the next generation, and not just the next four years. 
And in the coming days and weeks, I'll talk about what the city needs to do to get its fiscal house in order and what it needs to do to continue luring corporate jobs downtown and what it needs to do to grow small businesses in the neighborhoods. And I have ideas to make our city cleaner, healthier, and more inviting to immigrants, but those ideas will have to wait for another day. <laughs> to me, it all starts with new ways to address crime and better ways to educate our kids. And we must be a city of innovation in our schools, with our police department, and so many other areas. Settling for the same old schools and the same old policing means more of the same old school to prison pipeline. And that's the old school mentality, it's not mine. I refuse to be a caretaker mayor. I'm excited to work with all Chicagoans to shape our future together, a, sh a future that's based on a vision for the next generation, as I said, and not just the next four years. I hope everyone who loves this city, all of you here today, everyone watching through social media channels, you know, will join this campaign to make it a reality. I know I'm gonna get the hook here, but I'm gonna finish here with saying. Let me sum it up by saying this. Improving public safety is a central challenge to our next mayor. We have a moral imperative to close the achievement gap for our students. And my 50 new initiative for community schools can be a tremendous tool to push back the wave of violence that threatens the very fabric of our city and casts a shadow on our collective future. We have to rebuild bonds of trust and cooperation between our police and the people they're sworn to serve and protect. And we have to reckon with this and all our challenges honestly, openly, and as one community, even as we celebrate the diversity in this city that makes it the great city that it is. We do have some serious challenges, but nothing we can't overcome together. I love this city with all my heart, and I don't believe that our best days are even remotely behind us. We live in the greatest city in the world, but guess what? It needs to feel like it's the greatest city in the world for everyone. So I welcome the chance to bring my experience, my new energy, and ideas to City Hall to ensure that the city of Chicago that my six-year-old grows up in is even greater, stronger, and yes, safer than the city we know and love today. I hope you'll join me, and don't forget to vote for me. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, <coughs> Susanna. Um, we have several questions that uh, people would like you to address, if possible. Um, so, let us um, get started. The very first question is from City Club member Shar Rivette with the Chicago Children's Advocacy Center. Shar, awesome. where are you? Yes. Right over there. Uh, her question is, one in 10 children are sexually abused before the age of 18. Yet the city of Chicago doesn't have a comprehensive sexual abuse prevention initiative. Will you support funding a citywide strategy? Can I see that? Sure. <clears throat> Char, thank you. First of all, let me just give a major shout out to the Chicago Children's Advocacy Center. I mean, the work that they do is amazing. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm trying to remember who I was with the other day that we were driving right down and I looked at the building and I said, do you guys know about the Children's Advocacy Center? And they're like, no, I haven't heard about it. I'm like, and they thought it was like a daycare center or something, <laughs> which probably you get that a lot, right? And I'm like, they do God's work there. Like, I mean, I, it's amazing what you do. I don't know how you do it, but let me just say that as controller, it's been my honor to help in any way that I can make sure that you guys get the funding that you need when you need it. Uh, and you're going to have a mayor, like I said, I think you, hopefully you're getting a feel for who I am and what drives my heart. I mean, it's driven around kids and people who are vulnerable. Because I don't want people to be vulnerable, I want them to be self-sufficient. And especially children who've been victimized, whether it's sexual assault or we victimized them ourselves by not providing kids with special needs and services that they require, I think as a city we should lead with a moral compass. And as mayor, I'm going to do that. And I'm not going to let anybody tell me that there's not enough money or that to be thinking small about what we need to do to take care of the, I, don't, I never would say, like I don't want to say the least amongst us, this is more of a biblical term, right? But like children 
and seniors and sick folks. That has been the moral compass that I've used in the controller's office, and you had a, a, a glimpse at who I am. So I would just say that as mayor, I look forward to making Chicago a city that doesn't think of children with serious, serious issues that are gonna be lifelong trauma, or children with disabilities in our schools as an afterthought or people with disabilities, period. When we craft policy in the city and frankly in the state, it's like, ooh, don't forget, right? Our policy should be driven, first and foremost, by a moral compass, and if we do that, we're gonna be okay. We're gonna be a lot better than just okay. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for that question, Shar. The next question deals with uh, city's pensions. It's from Jerry Lathero with uh, Lathero and Dagnan. <laughs> Beyond seeking help from the state of Illinois, how will you address the city of Chicago's pension issues? Well, thanks for the softball question. Who gave it to me? <laughs> Who? Where? Raise your hand, bold one. <laughs> All right, yeah, thanks for the softball question there, Jerry. Um, look, th this is the one of, you know, again, I don't want to say it's the biggest issue because I think, like, you heard me think, talk about today, violence, I think, is the biggest issue in Chicago. Um, Having said that, there's one person who is running for mayor today that has had to lead through the states, the state through the worst fiscal crisis in its history. I've done what many people thought was impossible to do, and that's actually give the markets calm during the Bruce Rauner reign. Uh, when we were, the governor was actually taking steps every day to make our finances worse, and I had to go out there and assure the markets that we would be making our debt service payments, that I would honor them every step of the way, um, and champion a refinancing bill. It's a bond deal, which is different than what the mayor is talking about right now for the city, but that bond deal worked out to be a really great deal for Illinois. Now, I don't know any of us have the answers of what we would do tomorrow to solve the bond, uh, the pension crisis. I mean, bonding has been one of the issues that have been talked about, but we're certainly looking at all the options. And once I became controller, I was able to peel the curtains back and take a look at what our actual numbers look like. What are those deals that would make sense or don't make sense? You don't want a mayoral candidate who should be telling you right now that I'm going to do a bond deal at this percentage and over this amount of years, because none of us have access to those financials in the way that the mayor of Chicago currently does today. So I promise you this, I'm not afraid of tackling financial issues. It's what I've been doing over the last two years during the worst fiscal crisis in our state. It's actually my sweet spot. So I'm going to get to work on, on, I promise you this, whatever deals we decide to do, whether it's a bond deal, whether it's $10 billion or any percentage thereof, how we structure that, I'm going to share those ideas and my thoughts as to why we need to look at certain avenues, financial tools, and how they would work out. If we do this, uh, what do we expect the returns are going to be? If we don't do this, what are we going to be on the hook for and what other revenues would we have to do to generate the finances that we're going to need to deal with the pension debt? I think one of the biggest things that upsets Chicagoans is the same thing that upsets Illinoisans is that the lack of transparency that exists when it comes to how we're spending your tax dollars. I led a, a transparency revolution in the state of Illinois and I'll bring that into the mayor's office as well. And I believe that there are going to be tough decisions. But I think that it's easier to get the public to understand that these things have to happen if they know why, what they look like. Let's just start there. They know how their money is, what the plan is to spend their money. So I don't have an exact answer of what my deal would look like if I even do one or what all the financial tools are until I become your mayor. But you should have a level of confidence that I can handle, more than handle the job. And um, I'm excited. So let's get done. Let's get done. Okay, thank you. Um, this is from Shashi, who's with Agile N2N, he's a city club member. Could you share your ideas on workforce transformation? Workforce transformation, uh, in the context of, can you give me a little more definition on that? Where is he? Shashi, where are you? In terms of technology, or in terms of the jobs of the future? Shashi, are you here? Oh, there he is. Future capabilities. Yeah, look, I mean, I... In, in the product life cycle, right, when you're in school and you learn about the product life cycle, I am an early adopter. I'm one of these people who love to be on the cutting edge of what's happening in technology and how we can utilize technology to, to redefine a workplace in a way that provides greater service to customers uh, at lower cost. I did it in the clerk's office when I was the city clerk. We got rid of the archaic 105-year-old system of selling city stickers in one month. 
and having people wait three to four line, three to four hours in line. Last night I was at a restaurant. This, I'm not kidding. There are witnesses to this that are in this room today. And this guy called Elvis came up to me and go, oh my God, you're the city clerk. You changed my life forever. And I was like, what? Why? Because I used to have to wait three hours in line for that stupid city sticker. And I went the other, you know, it was like three to five minutes. I said thank you to every single person in the room. So my point is, it's really not life changing, but you can utilize technology because you have to think about technology when it comes to the workforce, not in what's the technology that you're using, but what's the goal? Like, who are the people? What's the process that we're going to need to imply to create better efficiencies? And then what's the right technology that we need to adopt to make it all happen? So I think you're talking to a person who, frankly, is a geek about it and would look forward to, as I said in part of my speech, Chicago is a city of innovation. We're not going to move backwards in how we innovate. And I look forward to helping lead the city into the future in so many different categories that we're a little bit behind today. OK, thank you. This is from uh, Vikram. Ridhar, and his question is um, very simple. Uh, as mayor, will you raise property taxes even higher than the Emanuel administration has raised them in the last few years? Man, thanks again. These are awesome questions, yeah. <laughs> Uh, look, that is the last thing on earth that any mayor wants to do. I think there are other ways in which we can uh, address revenue shortages. We're looking at a progressive income tax on the state level. I will fight for a casino as your mayor. I think the difference between me and other mayors is that, uh, with all due respect to other mayors, is you know, I know how Springfield works. I know how to navigate legislation through it. I never, I don't think I've ever lost a bill that I, that I introduced actually in the chamber, and, like that I called for a vote. Um, I mean, I, I have an impeccable track record of getting things done down there, not because I'm some superstar, because I know how to work with people to help them, and in turn, they help me. And when I'm mayor of Chicago, you know, I don't think it's a, an us or them mentality. I, I'm going to work really hard, not just for the people of Chicago, but I'm going to use the mayor's Rolodex to help other mayors in other parts of this state be able to leverage resources for their communities that don't compete with what we're trying to bring to Chicago. I mean, I said it last night, I'm gonna be next November, I'm Mayor Coleman, can hold my feet to the fire. In Cairo, Illinois, pretty much the furthest southern tip of this state, like we've been for the last couple years, handing out turkeys and food to people that feel that they're forgotten and invisible, but more importantly, way more importantly, the mayor of Chicago will be there with my Rolodex to see how we can make sure that businesses that are looking at Missouri and St. Louis instead are looking at Cairo, Illinois. That's the power that a Chicago mayor who actually loves the entire state of Illinois can do to bridge the gap between, it's the same as you know neighborhoods versus downtown. I don't want it to be neighborhoods versus downtown. We need to be one Chicago, and the state of Illinois, it's long overdue that we have a state that loves every part of itself. And I hope to bridge that gap as well. So David and you, and uh, you still use a Rolodex, huh? Okay. It's my smartphone. There you go. Okay, good. Um, so we've you've really had uh, some really good questions. So we'll give you a real softball. Oh boy, I'm, I'm fearful of this. Will your high school soccer coach, who did that great commercial during your last campaign, does he have a role in this campaign? Well, let me clarify, that was not my high school soccer coach. My high school soccer coach was Mike Makovich, who actually was the assistant coach of the Chicago Fire after he left uh, high school. But uh, that was my all boys traveling soccer coach from Bolingbroke, Illinois. And it was before I got to high school. And yeah, he might very well have another cameo because, man, he was like the best part of that commercial, I have to say. Besides me landing that super cool trick, which I can still do in real time, uh, the coach was the best part. So yeah, maybe we can recruit him once again. OK, so now that we gave you that one, here's a real toughie. This is from uh, Mark Weyer Mueller. Mark, where are you? OK, 99. <laughs> After this question, you're going to go to 100. Concerning the pension situation in Illinois, would you support IRAs or 401ks on new public sector employees and a constitutional amendment 
to fix the existing system? Um, so I want to be on the record saying that I've already voted for pension reform when I was in the legislature. I mean, we created the tier two and the tier three systems that we have in place today. Um, I do believe in keeping our promises to pensioners. It wasn't their fault that their pensions are insolvent. Um, and I think that pensioners shouldn't be looked at any differently than a business would look at a contract with a different business. But when you enter into a contract, you expect it to be honored. If you don't, you sue, right? And uh, when we made a contract and a, and a pension promise to our hardworking state employees or city employees, um, you know, when we make mistakes as government officials, they shouldn't pay the price for that. So um, number one, if you even did pass a constitutional amendment, that changed the Constitution moving forward, uh, this is kind of like, a dis it's a dishonest argument even, because even if you did that, you're still not going to be able to diminish or impair uh, benefits to the existing uh, pensioners prior to that change. So that $133 billion unfunded pension liability, we're still on the hook for it, no matter what. So I feel like there's just misinformation out there with the public. We think that this is an easy solution. It's not an easy solution. Here's the deal. We have to pay and honor our commitments. And every day that we sit here talking about, well, are we going to pass a constitutional amendment that can fix the whole thing, is one more day that has gone by without putting any additional principal into the current pension funds. That's a Mistake. Let's be honest about what our problems are and figure out a way to fix them. But I would suggest that we, any new revenues that come into the state, whether it's from casino or marijuana or um, a progressive income tax, that a portion of those revenues be fully, a portion of them, right, be dedicated and locked in to payments directly into those insolvent pension funds so that we can bring down that amortization rate and eventually, more importantly, give the markets at least some semblance of that there is a plan and they will therefore have a little bit of stability and predictability moving forward. That's what they want to see. No one expects us to figure out a way to pay down on a state level. It's $133 billion. The city, $28 billion. Uh, there's no plan to pay that down right now unless everyone just services shut down for everybody and it still wouldn't be enough. We just need a plan that shows that we're being serious about not just talking about the issue but actually putting some money into these pension funds. Thank you. We <laughs> One last question and uh, then a comment. Um, you spoke a lot about education in the schools. This is from Nick Kacharousis with DePaul University. Nick, where are you? Kitchen. Okay. Your 50 new program sounds exciting. Good. <laughs> you know, this is bear trapping. A but. How do you plan to pay for these programs? Do you expect all needs to be met from Springfield? <clears throat> Good question, Nick. I mean, like, here's the deal. Um, we fought really hard over the last few years. I traveled the whole state of Illinois along with Senator Andy Menard fighting for uh, education funding reform, which was all based on creating greater equity, uh, not just evenly dividing up payments of new revenues to Chicago, but utilizing those equity dollars to be effective in the most underserved and greatest need, largest achievement gap areas of the city of Chicago. It's how the money is, should be and I believe is supposed to be used. We're gonna use some of those additional funds that are coming in and just be very vigilant about how we target them to get the greatest return on investment. I have said many times over and over, it's almost like you know, you could, I could tattoo it onto myself as a controller. I've told the markets, looked them straight in the eye and said, Illinois will always be a sound investment. We will never default on our debt service. Let me say something. Chicago children will always be a sound investment, and I will never default on them. So we're going to figure it out. I'm going to ask the business community, the philanthropic leaders in Chicago, who are some of the most generous people I've ever met or have heard of, because I certainly don't know them all, but I will as mayor. I'm going to ask them. So many people that I've met with running for mayor have asked me, what are you going to do about violence in the city? Well, I'm going to ask them, what are you going to do to help me fix the issue of violence in the city? And it's going to start by asking them to be generous towards creative, different thinking, bold ideas that, frankly, will hopefully be transformational because that's the kind of mayor that I want to be. I'm not interested in just, you know, sitting back and managing the status quo for the next four years. To me, I get one chance in my life to run for mayor of the greatest city in the world. I mean, who'd have thought? 
in my wildest imagination, I would have never thought that I'd have this opportunity. So you better as heck believe that I'm not going to squander it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is a uh, comment. It's from uh, Dan Marquez, who's the brother of a fallen police officer. And you started your program by bringing our attention to the two officers who gave their lives in the line of duty last night. Um, and he says, I appreciate your support for the CPD. I believe we need more community policing where there is more engagement with our parents, children, and young people. Uh, last night on TV, Kevin Graham, the uh, head of the uh, Fraternal Order of Police, said that um, right now we're at about 13,200 police officers in Chicago. And he said we really need about 14,000 200 police officers. Um, so I guess the question is, will you support the adding of more men and women to the Chicago Police Department in your tenure as mayor? Um, Danny, where are you? Is he still He's here? right over here. You're going to make me cry. Yeah, your brother Don was one of the best men I've ever met in my life. And honestly, if every police officer smiled the way your brother did, we wouldn't have any problems in this city. He, was this, he had this like million dollar contagious smile, am I right? Um, but yes, I, part of what I said today is we need more police. And specifically, we need more police detectives because we're leaving so many crimes unsolved. And when crimes go unsolved, they just continue to mushroom and get bigger and bigger and bigger. And people's hopes get lower and lower and lower. Right, so I fundamentally believe that people who live in high violent crime areas want to have a good relationship with the police. They want the police to come when they're called. But also the police, when they put on that uniform, I know for a fact that the vast majority of them want to be the good guys. We have to figure out how we make this happen. And it's not just about adding more police officers. It is in fact about changing how we police our streets. Um, have more of a contact on a daily basis with the people who you're serving and protecting. Um, when you don't have those relationships, that community policing aspect, there's, it's, it's, it's not personal, right? It's not personal. We want those police officers to care about the people that they're patrolling and watching over to get to know who those constituents are because you don't build trust overnight. It takes time. Um, but we do need more officers. I will fight for that. I, I also think, though, it's not just about the number of cops that you add, but the quality of the police that you add and the mentality shift that we need to have away from a warrior and more of a guardian. I think every little kid who plays police officer, I see it with my son. He puts on his little pretend police outfit and his handcuffs and his ticket book, and we don't want him writing tickets. But... I'm just saying, like, in his heart, it's because he wants to be a guardian. He wants to protect. He, he sees himself as the good guy. And that's how I want all of our children growing up in this city, seeing the police as someone they can trust, someone that will protect them. And our police officers, if they were that, those, if you want to be a police officer because you were thinking and pretending you were one when you were a little kid, tap back into that. It's not, it's not weak to show that you care. You know, I think the greatest... One of the greatest problems that we have is that people confuse kindness with weakness. And we don't need a police department that feels that way. There's so much power and strength in, in being a cool guy and actually being nice. And, and I think that if we have a mentality shift, and it's not going to be easy, that'll probably be the largest challenge that any mayor will have is trying to repair that relationship. But I'm going to do my best to make it happen. And, and whatever you can do to help me, you have relationships with those police officers too. Everyone in this room has, off, has relationships with police officers. Let's have this conversation that we have to think more of ourselves as guardians versus warriors. Don't leave yet. Don't leave. 